with that initiative, what we're really trying to do is not to say we need to take computers out of everything. Um, it's that the the trust we place in these things should be commensurate with their trustworthiness. So, you know, if you have trust in something that's untrustworthy, you can work on one or the other side of that or both sides, but you can either uh, depend on it less or make it more dependable. And so what we want to do is make it more dependable uh, because like you said, I mean, if you can get um, cardiac telemetry to a doctor before the patient gets there, then they can have waiting the right types of technologies, uh, people and processes to save that life. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of 401 Access Denied. I'm your host for the episode today. I'm Joe Carson, Chief Security Scientist and Advisor CISO at the Codex Centrify. It's a pleasure to be here with you, and I've got an exciting episode for you. And it's one that we haven't really veered into in previous episodes or actually to date. Um, and I'm really excited about this topic because for me, it's a passion of mine. Um, and I've got two awesome guests on the show today. Um, which we're kind of going to go and introduce them. So first of all, Bo, I'll pass over to you. Do you want to give us a little bit about yourself, what you do and where you're from and your backgrounds and what's, what what passions do you have? Uh, yeah, thank you. i um, really excited to be here. Uh, I'm Bo Woods. Uh, I, I wear a variety of hats. Um, been in the InfoSec uh, cybersecurity, cyber policy world for 15 to 20 years now, professionally. Uh, before that, I like to say I was a a security amateur. I made a lot of mistakes on my own and other people's computers. Um, <clears throat> I got into uh, this line of work because I was just kind of drawn into it. You know, like like a lot of us, uh, we were powered by curiosity to just like get engaged, get involved, pull something apart, figure out how it works, put it back together. Maybe you got some extra pieces lying around or whatever. Um, I've done a variety of things over my career, including a lot of consulting work. Uh, I still run a small consulting company. Um, done a lot with uh, DEF CON. You can see the DEF CON flag in, in the background here. Uh, and a lot of the villages, um, aerospace village, uh, uh, biohacking village, um, hack the sea and ICS village, uh, as well as uh, got involved a few years ago in a lot more in public policy. And as we were talking about before we kicked it off, mm -hmm. uh, worked for the Atlantic Council, which is a global public policy think tank for a few years. Um, then got pulled in by uh, the FDA to help develop new pathways to market mm -hmm. for medical devices, uh, which is some really, really interesting work. Uh, and now I'm, uh, in addition to many of the other hats that I'm wearing, I'm uh, advising CISA uh, with some of the security of uh, critical infrastructure in the US and internationally. Awesome. And, uh, you know, we probably crossed paths at some point in the past, because uh, when you mentioned a lot of those things, you know, we, we talked about the Atlantic Council and uh, also, uh, in the maritime side, I spent a lot of time doing the autonomous shipping side uh, and oh, attacking okay. the ships. So, um, absolutely. So, we probably at some point uh, cross paths. And also, another guest on the show, which is fantastic to have, as well as Paulino. Uh, Paulino, welcome to the show. It was a little bit about yourself and uh, your passions and uh, what you do. Uh, thanks, for Joseph, for the invitation. Uh, well, I'm Paulino Calderon, I've, I'm a Mexican. I've been in the InfoSec industry for about 15 years, I think. Right now, I'm working in WebSec, which is a consulting company. We do a bunch of AppSec and network security testing. And I guess the same as Bo, I started playing with routers back a long time ago. One of my business partners was really into router hacking. He started routerpoint.com back in the day. Mm -hmm. So I guess that was when I started kind of getting into IoT. At some point, I came across uh, paths with Bo at, at some Dervicon, <laughs> uh, I think, after party. And uh, we ended up co-authoring this book, which led me to work with people. It's, it's, it's a small world, as you were mentioning. Mm -hmm. I, I ended up working with people from a different state in Mexico. Uh, they're called Electronic Cats. Since we were developing new tools for some radio IoT protocols, they had some, uh, I guess, USB dongles that were brand new. We were testing them and using them in, in our book. And we started communicating with them to debug certain things. And that ended up becoming another project that I started with them called the Cat Sniffer, which mm -hmm. is a radio or, or a sniffer for radio IoT protocols. 
So I guess I'm in between also it's in between AppSec, network security. Uh, I've also I'm also a big fan of open source software. Mm -hmm. So I I've been contributing to Nmap since 2011. So I guess see um, some of you might have heard my name because of Nmap. Mm -hmm. A lot of my contributions are there. Uh, I've been developing Nmap scripting engine scripts for a while now. And a bunch of different things. Like I'll, I, I'm also, I guess I run a local OWASP chapter, uh, an official OWASP project as well. And you know, between work, hobbies, everything, I also own a restaurant. So I'm, <laughs> made, I made the jump in between actually owning a cafeteria, which I'm still deciding <laughs> if it was a good idea or not. But I, I love it. <laughs> so yeah. Absolutely. I mean, that's one thing is we, we curiosity is what drives all of us. That's that's for sure, uh, and we really do. You know, it's this industry. It's it's. I, I agree. One of the things I find difficult sometimes is, is separating work from my hobby, and ultimately, what I find is is that actually my work, you know, my hobby turned into my job, um, which is always a fun thing to do for sure. And one of the things that brought us together is absolutely is the fantastic book that you put together that you co-authored, uh, which is fantastic. And it's one of the, the, really the kind of, it's something that's been missing in the industry for a long time is really getting into the, the IOT risks and IOT hacking and hardware hacking and the threats that's out there. Um, I've been, you know, following the likes of Joe Grant for many years. I think we all have uh, into a lot of his early work in in the early two thousands, and uh, you know, it's it's an early in the industry, which is kind of really probably lacking a lot of the good, you know, let's say end to end understanding about how everything works because it is very diverse. There's so many you know, components into it. Um, just kind of give me a little bit about kind of the who, where did the idea come from the book? Um, who you know who came up with the idea? And I kind of love it up, you know, how, how much effort was put into putting it together because uh, I've done a few books. My, mine have been very thin, as you can see. <laughs> so um, it takes months to do those. Uh, but putting a book together that you used it, uh, I think it's uh, it's amazing and, and it's definitely needed in the industry. Yeah. Who wants to, um, who wants to start on that? I, well, okay. I think it was uh, Fotis, uh, Fotis Chances mm -hmm. um, brought the idea to us. It was like, hey, you know, we're doing a lot more in IoT security, and uh, at the time he was working at the Mayo Clinic. So mm -hmm. uh, initially, we were going to focus on medical devices. Oh, okay. Um, but I think very, very smartly, No Starch Press, who's a great publisher, if you ever get a chance to to write with them, um, they're really good. Um, they were like, yeah, that's a little bit too niche. Why don't you broaden it out to more IoT? We're like, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So. Uh, it became an IoT book, um, but over the course of, of doing it, it took us probably two years to get it all written and published. Many different iterations, many versions. We had some ideas that we we jettisoned. We had some things that, you know, since we sat with the material for so long working on it, we had new things that we were able to pull in. Um, and uh, like we have a whole chapter on um, methodologies, you know, so it's not just here's a very narrow thing, go, go hack on this stuff. It's like, what's the philosophy behind this? Mm -hmm. um, we've also got a lot of, uh, a lot of words dedicated to thinking through some of the consequences of this, right? Mm -hmm. We had uh, guest writers come in like Dr. Marie Mo, uh, who's very well known. She is both a security researcher and worked with Norwegian cert. Uh, and she's also a pacemaker patient. And she talked about some of the, um, some of the consequences of uh, hacking IoT devices, uh, because ultimately, at the end of the day, we don't want just to to empower people and equip people to be able to do the technical bits and bytes. Um, with the Internet of Things, you know, broadly including medical devices, power plants, you know, uh, maritime equipment, uh, aerospace, everything is is very very different. And if you don't have a great understanding of what happens after the hack. Um, mm -hmm. it could set up some really dangerous situations. We wanted to avoid that, right? We mm -hmm. wanted to make sure that we're uh, empowering people to um, understand all of the context and the consequences of what they're going to do so that they can be way better at it and do things that are more meaningful, more mm -hmm. important, rather than just you know finding the next little bug. Find a bug in something that's really critical and then you can, you can change the world with that. Absolutely. Yeah, and especially with technology that dies really fast, Mm -hmm. we, we wanted to put the, the holistic approach, teaching people how, how would you approach this thing? How, how could you create new tools that are not out there yet? 
because that's what the majority of thing of the time you will be doing, right? You will be breaching the gap and coming up with new things and new techniques. And also at the beginning of the book, we had very good content that couldn't get published because of the nature of it. So we ended up having to look for more generic and I guess replicable examples, which ended up becoming a good thing because we focus on getting things that are easy to replicate and they're cheap and accessible mm -hmm. for everyone. Absolutely. Yeah, and in fact, we uh, because we recognize that devices change so quickly, um, <laughs> Paulina, do you want to talk a little bit about the uh, the software stack that you guys put together? Which one? The like the uh, IoT Goat and some of the other things that we did in order to have uh, evergreen examples that people could work mm -hmm. on. Yeah, exactly. Uh, one of the projects that came out of the book while we were writing it was mm -hmm. OWASP IoT Goat, which mm -hmm. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the older version or the more. I guess, known version of the web code. Mm -hmm. So it, it was the same idea. It was a vulnerable in purpose uh, IoT PM. So it mm -hmm. was based on open, open WRT. It became an official OS project. We got funding for a student to work on it full time during Google Summer of Code, uh, I think last year, right before the pandemic started. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it, it, it kind of like became an OS official project from since then. Absolutely. I'm actually hoping, hoping that some point in time, because I know that uh, OWASP does has their IoT top 10. Um, I think it goes back to 2018 or so. Hopefully it'll be updated soon. <laughs> so I it definitely it's an area uh, that uh, I know they updated the web application one in the last couple of months. So hopefully the IoT one will also uh, get that same attention. I'd like to also get into, because for me, you know, I think over the years I've been dabbling into the hardware hacking and IoT side of things. I've been involved in projects. I've been involved in things like where we talked about autonomous shipping. I remember in the early days of uh, the issues was not technical issues, it was legal issues. In autonomous shipping, one of the challenges was in international waters, they couldn't actually have uh, vessels that didn't have anybody on the vessel. It was actually international maritime law meant that you actually had to have a person on the boat. So what they ended up doing was have, having those types of projects in local waters, the likes of Finland uh, in, uh, uh, let's say, uh, barges uh, and so forth and icebreakers and other things. So they actually focus on the projects. So one thing I like to, you know, it's also a very kind of kind of focus area where it can, you know, be expensive to get into um, because when you get into hardware hacking, the equipment, you know, if you think about some of the things, even digital multimeters and oscilloscopes, and I think I have a, have a array of things like bus pirates and blasters and uh, uh, great fight ones and stuff. I mean, what would you recommend people start uh, to get into it? Because, I mean, even you can get into not just about the hardware debugging side of things and you know extracting firmware, but you also get into there's the uh, software side. There's also the wireless side of things, the radio frequencies and uh, RFIDs. It gets into whole extensive different things. Uh, where would you recommend people get started? What's what's the what's the essentials they should have in their labs? Yeah, I think um, one of the things that is kind of cool, but also kind of daunting about IoT is uh, you. there's so much stuff that can be IoT, right? Yep. Um, you've got on a lot of these devices, you've got a web stack. So if you're mm -hmm. familiar with uh, with uh, web application security or mobile application security, they've, a lot of them have apps. Mm -hmm. So that can be kind of the gateway that gets you into this. Um, and in fact, when we were doing for the biohacking village, uh, uh, Fotis and I, I met, I met Fotis through the biohacking village. Okay. Uh, I started the device lab there and we started up a, a capture the flag. Uh, and I think it might be the first, uh, but now it's not the only, but the, the first, uh, capture the flag for medical devices. Um, and we wanted to have a steady ramp because IOT is intimidating for a lot of people, but what we wanted to show them is that if you have skills here, you can translate them here. If you don't have skills over here then maybe you team up with somebody in this in the capture the flag and you learn those skills and you teach them you know the web skills and you learn the the RFID skills or what have you um, and so i think uh, uh, for a lot of people iot can be really accessible some corner mm -hmm. of iot that you can start working on and learn some of the other things um, but i know paulino's got a really extensive lab and does a ton of stuff uh, he's way smarter on on some of the pieces that i'm not <laughs> uh, which is great um, 
Paulino, why don't you talk about your lab a little bit? I, I've seen some pictures I, I, I of think, it. But, uh, I think I, I was going to say the book kind of brought, got brought together like that. Like everyone brought mm -hmm. their own expertise in their own area. Mm -hmm. And that's how it kind of came one piece. Uh, but uh, same as me, I, I suppose that I, I, I started uh, with the basic multimeter, you know, oscilloscope, mm -hmm. uh, some board to communicate with the traditional protocols. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, recently I started like going more into radio IoT hacking. Mm -hmm. So we, we had this new board and we've been working on this board for a while. Uh, I kind of like this project a lot be because it's an open source hardware. So mm -hmm. all the schematics are posted and it's also the software as well. But um, I don't know. I, I will always recommend to get one of those. It's a cat sniffer. A cat sniffer Everything like most, it. yeah. I guess the most common IoT protocols are supported there now. Mm -hmm. If you're planning with to play with radio IoT hacking, you should definitely get one. And we're planning to do something as the bus pirate does. You know okay. how the bus pirate, you have macros pre-programmed to attack certain protocols mm -hmm. or known attacks to re replicate? We're yes. trying to do the same on, on the cast saver for radio IoT. Oh, interesting. So, uh, okay. Yeah, my, my answer will be just uh, depending on what area you're planning to get to, mm -hmm. uh, just familiarize yourself with what technologies are there and take it from there. Yeah, because that's actually, I think, where I started a lot is in the radio side. Um, I got into, quite a few years ago, into SDR, uh, you know, you know, listening to radio signals, you know, amateur broad, you know, uh, was it uh, radio bands, get into the things of, you know, listening to the ISS space station, uh, you know, and listening to local pilots and then getting the ACARs and uh, ADIS and stuff, you know, coming back in. Um, so that's really where I started and then kind of moved from there into other areas. So, you know, for me, it's absolutely when you're talking about, you know, being able to, with the radio side of things, it's always an interesting, because for me, it was in, in maritime signals. It was all about, you know, uh, about, um, the uh, navigation of ships and vessels and communications and so forth. So that was always interesting. And also a very cheap way to get in as well, because a lot of those SDRs now were very affordable, where previously, you know, could be very expensive. Um, so definitely an area for people. I mean, when, when you're going through the book and there's a lot of devices that you recommend in the book, um, what kind of, what, what would be the first area in the book that you recommend people to, to go through? Um, let's say as one of the test scenarios, I know you mentioned a lot about the, there's a couple of scenarios with the blue pill or the black pill that's been used, uh, into, uh, being able to, you know, read and write firmware. Uh, what areas are you to recommend people getting started or just getting some older vulnerable hardware and pulling it apart? Um, so there's some older webcams or routers. What would you recommend people getting started when they're going through the book in regards to doing some of the tests? I would recommend that they uh, try to get the hardware that we put there because mm -hmm. most of it is open source and they can get it for a fairly low price and it's mm -hmm. accessible for anywhere in the world. But what I would recommend is like uh, kind of like start playing around what, what you have around the technologies or the mm -hmm. things or appliances that you have at work and at home and that way you don't need to end up like me with boxes of <laughs> full of devices that you never use and you don't have space to anywhere to put them absolutely i think yeah. we all we all have a lot of old mobile phones around our uh, homes that definitely uh, are just sitting gathering dust um so you can definitely pull those apart and you know start checking and reading you know uh, the firmware from them as well absolutely that's a good good starting point this is is is, is use the things that's around you that might be broken um, be curious, pulling apart, open it up. Because um, definitely one of the things I, I went through is the SEC website where you can actually go and start looking at a lot of the schematics um, and, and looking at what things, you know, the radio frequencies that are published there because they do have to post the radio frequencies, whether it being things like doorbells or whether it being remote controls or, you know, Wi-Fi signals and so forth. So definitely looking at a lot of those areas. Um, so do, definitely, but what do you think around that side of things? Where would you recommend people get started as well? Yeah, I mean, start with whatever you, you're excited about. Like mm -hmm. for me anyways, like if I'm excited about something, I'm naturally going to put more time into it. I'm going to learn it better. Um, and then like, it, like you said, anything you've got just laying around can also be mm -hmm. a good starting point. Uh, but also I, I kind of want to point out that different people might have different starting points and mm -hmm. it can be okay. Right. Um, I've had a number of people who like, they're not technical at all. And they're like, Oh, I bought the book and it was great. I'm like, you like, <laughs> 
no disrespect, but you don't have a technical background, technical knowledge. Like, yeah, but like some of the examples up front and some of the, mm-hmm. some of the other things in there, I just perused through it. And, you know, some of it was really accessible to me. Um, and some of it was really super dense, but I enjoyed reading it anyways. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we did try to create pathways to entry for different types of people. So the first couple of chapters are really non-technical. Yeah, very um, strategy focused and risk yeah, focused. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And the last chapter too is like how to, okay, so you've got these things in your enterprise. Mm-hmm. How do you defend against potential attacks? And so we made it that way intentionally so that it would have a broader um, Mm -hmm. accessibility so that people could get it, be less intimidated. And again, have that entry point where they could start learning like, oh, I I really want to know how you do, um, you know, pivoting from one device you get access to into the rest of the network. And so like there's there's some breadcrumbs there that Mm -hmm. can lead people to um, jump into whatever section they're most curious about. And then keep the rest of the book on the shelf as just a reference. Absolutely. I mean, that's, I showed you my version, which has got uh, <laughs> full of yellow post-it notes, yeah. which is something that I've commonly done. I think the first, one of the first things I, I end up getting more into the the, the uh, hardware diagnosis was one, as I mentioned, I got into the radio side of things. You know, I get into RFIDs and I had a couple of Proxmarks and uh, um, comedians and so forth. And one of the things I ended up doing was years ago when I did accidentally, I plugged it into the wrong virtual machine. And I did a flash of my Proxmark and like many people out there, we bricked it. And you're just like, uh, what do I do? And then you go and you get yourself a bus pirate <laughs> or something similar. <laughs> and you start trying to flash the firmware through JTAG. And and that that was one that was probably one of the first ones I really started getting into was actually by myself breaking something and then going and trying to find as much information as possible. And that was for, you know, and it, there was no there was no for me at the time, there's no one guide. There was no, somebody had something about, here's how you flash the, the firmware on it. Somebody had something about, well, if you run into this error when you're flashing it, this is the uh, chip on the pin that you need to short circuit in order to actually get it to reset. It was, it was things all over the place um, in order to try and go through it. And that was for me as breaking my own things was one of the reasons why, of course, you don't want to go out and buy new ones or replacements. So the best thing is to repair it. Um, and I think that's really a lot of things is that curiosity of things and repairing them. Um, it was kind of, so for me, that was one of the areas I started was, was breaking a Proxmark, um, and, and can I trying to get, uh, it to work with the low cost as possible. I'm just curious into, um, you know, is that one of the things that, one of the things that at the time when I was going through that I realized what I wasn't really good at, uh, was soldering skills. Um, I've set off too many fire alarms and, and smoke alarms uh, over the past couple of years, which <laughs> probably more than what I'd like to to mention. But um, you know, is that something? You know, what what areas? You know, you mentioned about you know going to other people who have knowledge in those areas. Um, you know, do you recommend kind of people trying to explore skills in soldering um, and power? I don't know how many times you've short circuited and, and got electric shocks over the times as well. Um, so safety is always first. Uh, so any, any thoughts around people who's looking to, to enhance those skills? How, cause it is very physical focused. It's very the hands on, um, rather than what we would have done kind of more you know, the soft side of things. Any thoughts around people who's looking to get into the soldering side of things and, uh, uh, repairing and, and electricity. Yeah, I'd say it's a skill that I encourage people to get familiar with, even if you're mm-hmm. not going to use it a ton, uh, because when you really need to use it uh, and you don't have it, <laughs> then <laughs> um, you're you're going to get over ambitious and you're going to end up breaking something or in some cases breaking it more than it already is broken. Yes. Um, one of my first hardware hacking was way, way back in the day. Uh, with um, the original Xbox that came out okay. and uh, folks like uh, Bunny Wang figured out that you could mod the Xbox and uh, do other things with it, like turn it into a media server, which was pretty cool, right? Yep. And then, then send stuff out to your TV. Um, and uh, to do that, you had to get a mod chip for it. And I remember uh, I bought a mod, you know, I had the Xbox, which was, I don't even remember how much money that was. It was more than I wanted to spend, but it was a fun project. And then I had to get the mod chip special, you know, ordered from someplace else. And then it just came with like all of these pens. And I was like, oh no, what do I do now? <laughs> um, and so fortunately I had a, a friend of mine who is an electrical engineer 
and he had some of the equipment around um, and taught me how to do some basic soldering. Mm-hmm. And uh, after I, I screwed up two or three of the pins, he was like, let me just help you with the rest of that. <laughs> and so he, he ended up doing all the soldering to get the, the chip installed. Um, but uh, it, it's one of those skills that, again, I think it's really handy to have mm-hmm. um, and to develop so that you'll have it later when you need it. Uh, but I'm still not very good. Uh, you know, if I sit down at like hardware hacking village or someplace like mm-hmm. that at, um, at a hacker conference, uh, it's one of the, the things that's still daunting and intimidating to me, but there's and some cool pa- kits patience. out there too, that you can get patience. Yeah. That's, oh, one, that's one thing is, uh, you're doing ball, ball pin. Uh, I was watching, I think it was Jules was doing some ball pin stuff uh, a few weeks ago and just watching as he's posting his images. I'm just like, some people have really lots of patience to really focus on, on, on that area and so on. Uh, Pauline, I'd just like to get some of your thoughts as well on that area. You, you like to be, uh, was it agreeing on the electricity side of things? I think I've, I've seen, I've been sitting in the dark. I always have a flashlight nearby nowadays because a lot of cases I, I blow the fuses. Um, so just thoughts around uh, yeah, what you're thinking. <laughs> For, for me, for me, it was a new thing as well. I, I have a bad uh, eyesight, and also my hands are quite big. So it, it's like that part by itself, it's hard. So I go to practice a little bit when I started working with electronic cats. Um, and also, I think back in the day, I remember one of my friends took one of Joe Grant's course, and that's exactly what I remember the first time I started, you know, breaking routers that are, are in mm-hmm. mind and just uh, playing exactly more more hands-on approach into that. Absolutely. I was actually, I was registered for Joe Grant's course and it was the first one that was canceled uh, when the pandemic started, unfortunately. <laughs> so that was, that was always a, that was a sad thing. Hopefully at some point in time when things get back to normal, um, that I'll be able to get into Joe's, uh, was it a uh, course? Because it is very interesting, you know, just watching I, it. I always Cause... hear from, from people that it's fantastic, so... Yeah, but actually, one so one thing is you know what because when you get into you know Bo, you mentioned around DefCon and DefCon is definitely when I go around the villages. I hang out sometimes at the IoT. There's also you know the Packet uh, Village. Um, there is of course the uh, um, was the biohacking villages now and the medical devices and the voting the voting village. Now it's really got into where it's it's, it's almost everywhere. You know when you go to DefCon, pretty much a lot of the villages are really focused around the hardware side of things. Uh, what what events? What other events throughout the year? Um, I think there's a couple of hardware. Uh, there's hardware.io events. So I think that's uh, another major event that uh, focused around. And I did see uh, one of my favorite events last year was KernelCon, uh, which I so much. It was, I think for me, it was one of the most enjoyable events. Just to sit back as a as a. Normally, I, I get a lot where I'm going to events and I'm speaking, but that was one event where I just sit back and I'm just I'm just going to watch and learn. And I was watching, it was Joe Grand running around looking for basically a blowtorch or a heater or something. It was it was really entertaining. What other events do you recommend people? Because because this is, it, as you mentioned, Bo, you mentioned about that, you know, looking for someone who can help you. This is a very much a, a, it's a, it's a, you need people to help you. <laughs> There's a lot of, you know, this isn't something that I recommend that you go and, and only do by yourself. You do need people who have specific expertise and skills to help guide you to make sure one is safety and you don't electrocute yourself um, because there is volts flowing through a lot of the devices. Mm-hmm. Um, what other events do you recommend people go to, to try and network and, and, you know, connect with people uh, to, to learn more? Yeah. You mentioned one of them, hardware IO, the, mm-hmm. the folks that run that are, are great and they've expanded it. Um, I remember the, the first hardware IO that they had in the Netherlands. Uh, mm-hmm. I went there and, brought some stuff, um, some car hacking stuff and some other, or some people who did car hacking and got them introduced. Uh, and it was really cool to see that community start to build and grow. And now they've got events all over the world. I think they've got, uh, I think they just did one in Berlin. Um, they do some in the U S, uh, obviously the Netherlands, they've still got that, but that's Mm -hmm. a great place to go get training on hardware hacking. Uh, and it's exclusively dedicated to hardware stuff. Absolutely. So even if you just go and hang out, you'll learn a ton. I learned a ton. Um, obviously, uh, to, you know, some of the DEF CON trainings, uh, mm-hmm. and other things, um, some of the villages you mentioned are really cool. Uh, but also like maker hacker spaces in your own community. If you've got one around, mm-hmm. uh, where you might be able to just drop in on a, you know, a Wednesday or whatever, when they're doing an open, um, an open session and go learn there or, um, you know, some other 
other similar types of things. There's, there's a big community around hardware hacking and growing too, um, depending Absolutely. on where you live in the world. Yeah, I find on online, uh, you can also help find help online through just mm -hmm. ask people that you know that are working on something similar than yourself. Most of okay. the time, they'll be willing to help you. Mm -hmm. That's true. Absolutely. Yeah, and we've thought about starting up like a, a Discord channel or something to to work with people. Um, you know, I don't know if other people would be interested, but uh, maybe one of the things we can do <laughs> with this is okay. We've got the first uh, first joiner. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I mean, there's got to be some communities, some other communities to tap into. Um, Paul, you know, we should probably get more involved and check it out and see if there's already a Discord that we could join um, or, you know, how we want to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm probably, you know, the one probably hardware that is the closest to get to is uh, you know, with uh, Chris, uh, Christian uh, Iceman. Um, he runs the uh, RFID channel, which is mainly focused on radio. You know, was it, uh, but... It, it's it's focused on you know of course the prox marks other things and and they focus on the radio and RFID signals, but absolutely having a much more broad scope hardware one that of course you can separate into different channels that would be a great idea because um, I haven't I haven't seen one myself uh, I've seen ones that kind of have focused in certain areas but not as you said you know when you talked about uh, when you were doing the book that you know with no starch you know it's saying you need something a bit more broader and absolutely you know, for me you know a niche area that you focus into specific industries um would exclude a lot of people's interest but when you get into a much broader perspective um it gets a lot of people's interest in in there so uh, having a community and discord is a great way and i i thought the way kernel con did their event last year virtually um they did a combination of i think it was twitch and discord uh, was a great way and it was a great it was a really exciting event so they I, I definitely one that i thought was really well executed yeah and i guess uh to that point we we do have a um a channel for the book in the iot village discord mm -hmm. uh so if people want to want to check that out um you can go there uh we can get you the link to that yeah absolutely uh, like we'll, a, we'll make sure all the links that you send and share we'll get them into the show notes as well so so the audience will not yeah. have to go searching for them it makes me wonder now if uh, I don't know if Hardware Hacking Village has a Discord, but um, maybe there's uh, maybe people could go check that out if they do. Absolutely. So for for Oregon, one of the things that you know, of course, a lot of the in the past, the hardware side was mainly either focused at consumer side, and also you know you know most consumers were adopting a lot of IT, and then it was also dedicated businesses. Um, I remember. Um, one of the, one of the things I worked on, it was actually one of the earliest things I worked on was basically was in the medical side of things where, uh, I, I was responsible for the ambulance service. And one of the first things I, I did was I, we, we had to buy a bunch of new ambulances. And at the time, uh, there was a major, we were under SLA, which was that if the ambulances didn't get to the emergency or to the, to the victim and back to the emergency room, but a certain amount of time, we actually had legal uh, requirements in order to make sure that we were able to get to any victims in 21 minutes. So one of the things at the time, and this is back in, I think it was 1999, 2000, we end up connecting the, uh, e, uh, was it uh, defibrillators and EPGs within the ambulances. We took an old Nokia 3110 with a data cable, and we were sending all of those through fax into the emergency room. And so the doctors basically in the emergency room would have this fax print out of all the, the, the uh, health readings from the patients as they were en route yeah. to the emergency room. And for me, when I go back and you know, think of some of those early things, those were some of the things that we, you know, we were in a, in a kind of you know, trying to use technology to put all these pieces together to save lives. And it becomes very critical. Yeah. A lot of these things, and uh, over the times when people ask me in, in the security industry about what's my biggest fear, and I see that our lives are becoming more dependent on a lot of these technologies. You mentioned uh, about you know pacemakers that are connected, um, maybe can, communicating through people's mobile phones through the Bluetooth that's near field proximity and so forth. Um, what risks do we face uh, with a lot of you know as as IoT is becoming? I, I, my interpretation is always IoT. I think I think sometimes we use IoT as this very broad term. You know, and, and I remember one of my mentors saying you know we it's basically uh, network connected devices. We talk about IoT. It's literally the internet. <laughs> so a device is connected. Um, I think Bo had a great definition for IoT. What was that, Bo? 
Yeah, I don't even remember what it was, but it was like something something kinetic can happen from a computer connected thing, uh, which is again, it's still a very broad definition, but it gets it into that. uh, Yeah. Um, But yeah, I mean, you know, you, uh, one of the things I I didn't really touch on in my intro is uh, I've been pretty heavily involved in something called I am the cavalry over the past Mm -hmm. several years, which uh, the problem statement for I am the cavalry is our dependence on connected technology has grown faster than our ability to secure it in areas impacting human life, public safety. Um, And with the, uh, with that initiative, what we're really trying to do is not to say we need to take computers out of everything. Mm -hmm. Um, It's, that the the trust we place in these things should be commensurate with their trustworthiness. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you have trust in something that's untrustworthy, you can work on one or the other side of that or both sides, but you can either uh, depend on it less or make it more dependable. Mm-hmm. And so what we want to do is make it more dependable uh, because like you said, I mean, if you can get um, cardiac telemetry to a doctor before the patient gets there, then they can have waiting the right types of technologies, uh, exactly people, the, yeah. and processes to save that life. That was um, exactly the and that, so, that was the main goal was was having having yeah. readiness in the emergency room. So yeah. when people arrived, you had the right people that are waiting. That's right, and uh, you'll be happy to know, or maybe happy, maybe dismayed. Mm-hmm. But now um, having cellular connectivity on defibrillators and an ambulance is standard practice yeah. for that reason, um, right? And, uh, and so like we can use this technology to greatly improve lives, to save lives, Mm -hmm. uh, and to make things better if we do it right. But one of the things that I really fear is not the insecurity of the technology. It's the lack of trust, the distrust. Um, Mm -hmm. so when, uh, when, um, uh, a, a a hedge fund started short selling a medical device maker mm-hmm. uh, and they brought their, their, you know, trained hackers on TV to say, look how bad this is. Um, uh, everybody could die. Uh, you had a lot of like little old ladies and little old grandpas going into the doctor saying, cut this thing out of me. I don't trust it. Mm-hmm. Right. You had, uh, I talked to some nurses from the veterans affairs hospital. Um, and they said that they had, uh, patients, you know, military patients who would come in and they would say, I'm not going to get a, a pacemaker, even though I know it's going to save my life. Cause I'm afraid that somebody might hack it and kill me. Um, and, and so as, as part of the reason why we wrote the book, the way we did to talk to those consequences so that people are more conscious of them and don't make similar mistakes that can lead to, uh, people turning away from the best capabilities that we have to bring to bear on any particular problem. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, there's, I've also done a lot of work in other areas. So if you're, sounds like you're really into medical hacking. One of the things I do is I'm on the board of an organization, uh, called the CyberMed summit. And we did the first ever clinical simulations for hacked medical devices. So just like pilots, um, do flight simulators. So at the first time they're like landing with a 30 knot crosswind into fog uh, they've done it in a simulator and they know how to do it. They know how it feels. Um, doctors do the same thing. And so we had some some brilliant physicians who are also DEF CON speakers and hackers themselves who created these scenarios and ran a bunch of doctors through them um, in order to train on that and in order to get uh, understanding of what would actually happen. Uh, and it turns out that you know in healthcare, they've got a lot of redundancies, a lot of backups yep. for very good reasons. So yeah. in running through some of those scenarios, you know, the doctors through individual heroics were able to bring the patients back to life after a hacking event. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, but there was a, a, a big gap there, which is that the doctors themselves never questioned the medical devices. They just thought that it would either be working perfectly or not working at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there are some things that we can take from this to improve the way that things like medical devices work to improve the way that things like autonomous vehicles work, uh, mm-hmm. maritime systems, aerospace, you know, planes, industrial, trains. Industrial yeah, industrial. Controls. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I, I'm in this field. One of the reasons why I'm in this field is, well, it's, it's cool. It's fun. It's exciting. Mm-hmm. It's challenging, but also 
we can really do something better if we're consciously thinking, how do we improve it? Not just how do Mm -hmm. we break it? How can we build something that is better, that impacts human lives uh, in a positive way, rather than just the technical bits and bites of it? Absolutely. Well said. I mean, that's for, for me, you know, I think we're all looking to make the world a safer place. And, and one of the things I remember, you know, I attended, uh, it was uh, one of the last digital, not the last year's digital summit, uh, which was more about government uh, geopolitical side of things. Mm-hmm. Um, the previous year was on artificial intelligence uh, for me, which is basically just automation. Um, it's doing things in an automated way. Um, but then, you know, when we realized when we we're talking about it, it was about uh, we must do it in a with responsibility and accountability. You know, that's, it's, it's about doing things for the right reasons, not just because you can, but because you're going to make a difference. Um, you know, that's what I mentioned the, the kind of the story about the, the ambulances and the, the defibrillators and the emergency room. And that was all about basically saving lives. You know, my SLA at the time was is if my system wasn't running for 21 minutes, people died. That was that was my metrics. That's what I was basically measuring each year and every week. You know, I had to make sure the systems were running. And as it's you mentioned, one of the worst SS, SLAs. Oh, it's the worst SLAs you can have. It was. <laughs> yeah. I don't remember. It was. Uh, and the wor- worst. The worst scenario was. Well, you know, one, one of the worst things was. Um, then that was. You know, I was doing a uh, Y2K. I was going to run with the floppy disks, <laughs> trying to protect against Y2K at the time. And one of the things that we were doing at the time was. We were switching over um, our power. Our power was directly connected to the to the uh, energy, the phases, and we were switching to a UPS for redundancy, just in case Y2K took out the electricity. And uh, during that switch over the redundancy, um, I remember we had switched on the the mainframes at the time, which was old IBM Alpha servers, and we switched them off. And we brought the Mac online. We're standing looking at this dumb terminal, old McDonald Douglas dumb terminal screen. And with a little green flashing light, and I was freaking out because we passed the point of no return. The you know the clock had already passed the point where we can actually revert, uh, and we we're going: is the system up and running or not? We had no idea, and we ended up having to get because we had no. We were sitting in front of this server mainframe and no visibility of what was happening, so we had to get somebody from a remote ambulance service to connect back in through a dial-up line in order to see if actually anything was running on the server because it was it was how it was basically the emergency call line, you know, and that's how people find where people's addresses were. So if you wanted an ambulance to go to an address, that was how they find it in the system. Um, and ultimately end up being a serial cable was broken. Um, and I've never, never, <laughs> ever since, I always have a ser- an extra serial cable in my bike, unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> um, after that event. But that was my worry is always about, you know, and that's where we always should approach things when we talk about IoT, and, uh, you know, as you're mentioning, Bo, is it's, it's, we approach it with health and safety as a priority. And I think that's where we historically have probably not in, in our industry have been really focusing on the right metrics. We were always focusing about uh, vulnerabilities and patches. And, uh, uh, but we should really be focused around, you know, uh, the, the risks of the devices. What's the real true impact? And what's the likeliness of that possibility happening? Um, and I, that's really, really like the beginning of the book. It really brought that as the as the first thing was about what is the risks what impact do these devices potentially have how do you do threat modeling um what's all how do all these things connect together um, what's the dependencies in each of these areas and i thought the book did a really fantastic coverage in that and some of the methodologies um at the beginning really kind of highlighted uh, the importance that organizations that we should approach this and it's not and also sometimes as well it should not be just a it problem or a security team problem this is a business approach. Um, and that's sometimes, you know, when things go wrong, they point to the IT team, but you need to fix it. Our security team, this is vulnerable, you need to patch it. But don't realize that it's, it's, a, it's a business response. It's entire end-to-end. We all need to work together. Yeah, well said. So, so other things, what, um, you know, what, what do we need to do? You know, you mentioned about I am the Calibrate to really highlight these. How do, how do we move forward? This is one of the things that I'm always worried that we're a little bit behind. But we're definitely playing catch up in this field and area. Um, you know, we're coming up with a lot of great standards. I mean, in the EU, they're coming out with. I, I don't get labels and devices will be you know changing things very drastically. Um, we we did see the UK introducing a new law mm-hmm. that said about having no default credentials uh, on the system. So 
which is another great step forward. What things do we need to be doing um, in order to, you know, have, you know, more, more trustworthy devices? Yeah, I think you mentioned the UK code of practice for IoT mm-hmm. security. I think that's a great start. It's uh, within the last few years, it's become a, a EU standard. So mm-hmm. uh, the, the European Standards Group called ETSI, ETSI, I always forget what it stands for, has now issued a couple of standards based on that um, that are really well thought out. And that you know, for manufacturers, you can start building towards that. For hackers, you can start looking at those things and looking for those in devices and then framing it against that to have uh, uh, a more powerful way to kind of talk through that with the manufacturer or with policymakers. Mm-hmm. Um, Singapore, Australia, I think a couple of other countries have started adopting that as well. Um, uh, I know that in, I think it was in um, Norway mm-hmm. and in the UK and in Germany um, where the uh, like consumer product safety groups have raised awareness about security issues with IoT devices. Mm-hmm. And those countries have actually banned those specific devices. So I remember there was one where it was a, a Kayla doll. Uh, and if you talk to Kim Monroe at Pintest <laughs> Partners, Monroe, yeah, he's always yeah. got one of these yeah. um, that he brings out. But like you could hack the back end of it and pull down all of the data. Um, yes. the and I think that the, yeah. right. So when you, uh, one of the things for researchers especially is if you know about these types of issues, Mm-hmm. Don't just, you know, tell the company, they say, go away and then drop it on Twitter. But there's other avenues, right? In the U.S., mm-hmm. you can contact uh, U.S. CERT, ICS CERT, CERT CC. Uh, you can talk to other organizations who can help with that disclosure. Um, in different countries, they have different uh, groups that you can go talk mm-hmm. to. But, you know, if, uh, if overall our goal is to save and improve lives with these mm-hmm. things, then we should be careful and take all due care to avoid incidentally, accidentally harming it. Because at the end of the day, it's not about you. It's not about the company. It's got mm-hmm. not about the tech. It's about the impact to people. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I do see some challenges there. For example, mm-hmm. you've been talking a lot, a lot about policies in different countries, but mm-hmm. for Latin America, we don't, we're not really, you know, pushing anything new in regards to that. And, and, and I see a bunch of security problems at least uh, some of them have already been solved in different technologies. So mm-hmm. part of the problem, I guess, is how we are reusing the existing knowledge mm-hmm. and, and the challenge of, of what companies have. Like if, if there is are smaller companies, how can they afford, you know, a full on assessment of an external security? Maybe they don't have that knowledge. Mm-hmm. So I, I think the risk is like, or part of the risks might come from different countries. So whoever is producing those devices need to, you know, start taking security more seriously. And as you mentioned, you you see other, for example, Mexico is so so close to the U.S. Mm -hmm. and still we don't have anything in regards to that. We're we're about to come up with the first cybersecurity laws and, you know, we're ages behind or years Mm -hmm. behind, even though we're so close. And mm-hmm. at the end of the day, we consume almost the same technology. The, most of the same vendors are here. Absolutely. You, Paulino, you bring up a very important point, which is supply chain. <laughs> is that when you get into a lot of this, is that a lot of the hardware and components of IoT devices is, is sourced through the supply chains, sometimes through the lowest component and bidder. Um, and mm-hmm. we, had, we had a discussion. We had CJ and Katie on a while back in one of the episodes and we were covering responsible uh, disclosure uh, programs. In IoT, that's a difficult thing because sometimes, you know, it means replacing the hardware. Um, is, there, is there a responsible disclosure for vulnerable hardware? Um, and, you know, what's, is that something that we need to be kind of also treating with a little bit more caution because, it, you know, replacing, you know, one thing is updating the firmware. Uh, and a lot of these things that even the manufacturers these hardware probably has even a two-year warranty. Um, and then they stop delivering updates. So unlike software, where you might have a longer stretch. Um, what's your thoughts around responsible disclosure for IoT and also uh, the vendor's responsibility for keeping it secure over the longer term? Yeah, it, it can get really, really tricky uh, when you think about coordinated disclosure mm-hmm. on IoT devices. Um, and I know that there are some security researchers who 
have looked at the eco, they found a bug, mm-hmm. they looked at the ecosystem of all the things that are affected. And they said, you know, sometimes security through obscurity is all you've got. And mm-hmm. when that's the case, um, maybe you can't disclose. Uh, now, as we all know, repeat <laughs> discoveries happen and some of those were discovered again and disclosed in a very, I'll say limited coordinated fashion. So uh, you talk to the the single vendor who makes it, but not all of their customers. Mm-hmm. And so like at that point, you're just kind of in a race with the adversaries, um, which is not a place that anybody wants to be in. Um, and it, it gets really, really difficult because, uh, you know, if you do have to replace the device, like this is common in healthcare, I'm sure it's common in maritime, it's common in a lot of places, like this medical device is still saving people's lives. Mm-hmm. If we have to replace all of them that are in the hospital, it might cost $8 million. How many treatments will that get for people who can't otherwise afford it? How many doctors will that afford? How many nurses will that afford? Mm-hmm. Um, how many other things could we buy with that? And so you're in this situation where there's no easy answers. There's only really, really hard trade-offs. Yeah. And part of the equation is not knowable, right? Someone may hack it and cause something bad to happen. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, if you take those devices out of circulation, you absolutely know that patient safety and, and patient care will go mm-hmm. down, right? So like in a lot of cases, on the operator side, it's an easy discussion. It's an easy mm-hmm. choice for them. You take a, a guaranteed harm against a potential harm and they're going to favor the, uh, the um, avoid the, the guaranteed harm every time. For security researchers, though, it's really tough. I've talked to a number of people who just wrestle with this. They know things that could probably kill folks and they don't know where to, whether to tell and who to tell about it. Um, so we've got, A, we've got to do a lot better job um, shortening the time cycle between when the vulnerability is created by the developer and mm-hmm. when it is ultimately fixed across the entire ecosystem. Yeah. You know, not just the products, but when the, the patches and updates are applied. Second, building more defensible architectures so that we can withstand the occasional time mm-hmm. when you can't update. Um, third, uh, having a little bit uh, better, more responsive ecosystem among security researchers and companies mm-hmm. to be able to understand how, when, uh, where to apply some of these different approaches to coordinated vulnerability disclosure. Um, and you know, in 50 years, we'll have it all worked out, but we're, we're going through a a bumpy period and we'll, it'll get worse before it gets better, I think without, um, some concerted effort. So, you know, if you're a researcher, think about those types of things, whenever you find a vulnerability and, you know, uh, uh, something that could be in the supply chain for something that can't be replaced. Yeah. Think about the impact. Uh, Paulina, any thoughts on vulnerability disclosure yourself? Any I've gotten mixed responses from the vendors. Mm-hmm. I've, I've, gone, I've disclosed a few of them to, and I guess I've gotten better responses from, I guess, more reputable vendors. Mm-hmm. For example, I'm, I'm thinking one case that we actually didn't get a response back. And it's one of the examples in the book, the smart water bottle that we mentioned in the mm-hmm. book. It, it was the top seller back two or three years ago. And when we disclose the vulnerability to them, we, we try at least like five or six, seven times all the details there in the email. We didn't get a response back. And and part of the reason we chose that water bottle is because we knew it was harmless to disclose. Absolutely. Right? Like, you know, you could just spoof that they're drinking too much water. No one cares, right? But But at the end of the day, that ended up becoming a more critical thing when we discovered that your location was being disclosed without your consent every mm-hmm. 10 minutes by itself. So it is a tricky situation, as you mentioned. Uh, I feel, I find that, you know, you will get mixed responses. Most of the time you'll have to hold on the information and just uh, keep the secret, I suppose. Or it's not like you can patch it yourself, right? Yeah. So right. As, as Bo mentioned, you're, you are in a tough spot and you need to, Think about your the risks and yeah. your consequences. Of Especially for software vulnerability, what what we do is we you know we wait for the patches available, and that's typically you know within usually that ninety days or one hundred and eight days, depending on kind of the criticality there. But hardware, 
it's it's a little bit more challenging. So so it's been awesome to have you on the show. And one of the things you know, I'll definitely recommend you know for the audience, definitely do read the Practical IoT Hacking. Uh, it's a fantastic book. It's definitely something that you will learn a lot. For me, I learned loads of new things and new skills. Uh, for the audience, and you know, it's really in the hacking side of things. You really want to expand into IoT side of things. Um, Bo Polino, anything you'd like to leave the audience into something that they would should you know do next um, you know, beyond reading the book. Yeah, I just really encourage everybody to get involved with something that they really care about and, uh, you know, to, to take on IoT. It's challenging, uh, but it's mm -hmm. a lot of fun and you can make a real difference. Uh, I also feel like this field is very new. So a bunch of new technologies that are kind of like being brought into a bunch of products. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge opportunity for you to write new tools, software and hardware as well. So yeah, I encourage you to play around with that. You'll definitely have fun. Absolutely. I think for, for many in the, in the industry that this is a really great area to expand your skills into. And it's definitely in the future, you know, there's going to be a lot of jobs and a lot of exciting opportunities for people, you know, to work in this field. So uh, Bo Polino, it's been fantastic having you on the show. Really hopefully look forward to catching up with you at some point in an event. <laughs> um, so I'll yeah. definitely, you know, whether being at, uh, you know, DEF CON in the near future, um, or another event to really look forward to catching up. Um, again, many thanks for the audience. Again, subscribe. You know, Every two weeks we have the episodes. Uh, make sure you stay up to date. Go and look at some of the older episodes. And it's been fantastic, Bo Polino. Thank you for being on the show. You've been awesome guests. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.